welcome. Please come in, find a place, there are lots of seats over on this side. Well, thank you for all coming today. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 33rd Holiest Lecture. The USC Rossier School of Education and our Center for Higher Education Policy Analysis are proud to host what we believe is the most prestigious lecture in American academia. Over the last three decades, the Holiest Lectures have spotlighted renowned thought leaders, researchers, and practitioners uh, in the field of higher education, including university presidents and internationally known scholars. This year, we're showcasing game changers. And what could be more appropriate? As the USC Rossier School enters its second century, we have gained a reputation for innovative and outside of the box thinking, for being a school of game changers who are rethinking the fields of teaching and learning. We like to call ourselves radical thinkers. Many of you know that Rossier was the first school of education from an elite uh, research university to build an online Master of Arts in Teaching program. And now that program has, in less than uh, two years, 1,200 students and 300 graduates. And it is a multiple award winner for its robust platform and its multimedia, its use of multimedia. It is also fitting that our guests this afternoon are also experts in technology, innovation, and changing the game. I will leave it to my colleague, Dr. Tierney, to give thorough introductions, but I will say that the work of Jim G, as well as Henry Jenkins and Tracy Fullerton, is helping us understand how technology and emerging media platforms change a student's engagement and learning in formal education. I'm proud to note that Dr. Jenkins is now, now has a joint appointment with the Rossier School, as well as his appointment in Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism. Tracy Fullerton is a partner in Dr. Tierney's work on Pathfinder, an online tool for helping underserved students navigate the path to college. As interdisciplinary scholarship expand across USC, the commitment of the Rossier faculty to partner with those who can lift the teaching paradigm to a learning paradigm is a high priority. At Rossier, our call to action is innovate, educate, and transform. Today's Pulleus Lecture will be a robust conversation about how, by working together and embracing new methods, we can achieve those goals. It is now my honor to introduce Dr. William G. Tierney. He is the Wilbur Kiefer Professor of Higher Education in the Rossier School of Education and the Director of the Center for Higher Education Policy Analysis. Dr. Tierney has achieved the distinction of university professor and currently sits on President Nakias' USC Strategic Planning Committee. He's spent over two decades conducting research on college access for underrepresented youth, and his current work involves studies pertaining to remediation and college readiness, including the Pathfinder game I mentioned earlier. Dr. Tierney's mentoring programs to transition high-need students successfully into college were recognized by the Educational Testing Service as having the most impact on the most students for the money spent. Dr. Tierney and our colleague, Dr. Gib Henschke's most recent book explores the marketing, regulation, performance, and role in higher education of for-profit colleges and universities. I'm always honored to introduce my esteemed colleague and friend, Dr. William G. Tierney. Okay, so how this is gonna work is I'll introduce Tracy, Tracy will introduce Jim G, then Henry will speak, then there'll be some questions. My closing remarks will be to tell you where the food is. <laughs> So that's the most important part, I suppose. Um, but let me take a minute to speak about how we got here today. One of the key concerns of the center is trying to figure out how to help low-income youth get into college. President Obama and several other foundations continually point out that the United States is falling behind. By many estimates, in California, if we don't increase college going, in the next decade, we will be out of the race. We need a million more students than we have configured to attend post-secondary education over the next decade, and we have no plans to do that. 
Now, I spend a lot of time in poor schools, and there are a lot of students who go to college, who could go to college, but they lack college counselors. And I would like to see that change, but it's not going to. College counselors are going the way of the past. So what do we do? Three years ago, I spoke to President Nikias, then Provost Nikias, about this idea that I had. I thought if we created a game that was cool and kids used it, it might be a way to increase college going. President Nikias agreed and gave me some money to get it going with one stipulation. Max knows me and knows I know nothing about technology. He said this had to be interdisciplinary and I had to work with some people who know something about technology and games. Now based on research that I've done, I also have a summer writing program for students who are going to college. Mark Marino in SC's writing program has taught in that program and I asked Mark, who do I talk to? He said that was easy. The game innovation lab was the best in the country, he said, and Tracy Fullerton is the person to speak with. He warned me that she was busy. <laughs> I found my way over there to that other building. I walked up the stairs. I knocked on the door that is always locked. I knocked again <laughs> and again, and I finally got in. The rest, they say, is history. Tracy and I have been working together now for three years. We have gotten about a half million dollars in foundation grants and another million and a half from the Department of Education. If we all keep our fingers crossed, we might get another two and a half million this year from some foundations that shall go nameless and the department. Now we also have a great team. Monica Rad in the center runs the books for me and tells what I can and cannot spend because I would like to spend a lot of money. Zoe Corwin has her PhD in sociology and directs the project. Gigi Ragusa is director of the Center on Outcomes and Evaluation in Engineering and Education and our methodological whiz in ultimately telling us if we are succeeding. And John Sweet in the Stevens Institute is helping us think through our financial plan, business plan, marketing plan, all these plans that I know nothing about. But if you go back three years, there are two big events that I keep thinking about. First, I couldn't have done this without the president's help. There aren't many presidents like Max Nikias, and there aren't many places like SC, and I honestly mean that. And second, if I hadn't gotten in that door, I never would have met Tracy, and I probably wouldn't be here today either. So without further ado, Tracy Fullerton. We'll get you a swipe card, Bill, <laughs> so you can get in any time. So thank you. It's my, my real pleasure to be here to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, I'm not going to read from Jim's bio. You all have a copy of it, and I uh, assume that you're able to read his long and impressive uh, career. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about what he's done in the community that I'm a part of. Um, I've been a game designer for a long time too long to tell you how long, uh, and a game educator for a slightly shorter time. Um, and, and we game designers have had our own insular culture of inquiry filled with debates about formalism and narrativism and things that no one outside of video games really care about. And while we thought we were being rigorously critical of our form, uh, to be honest, um, uh, really no one from that insular community had the perspective to look seriously at video games' potential. Uh, to enrich our lives, to engage our minds, uh, and their importance in the development of our identities and our ability to learn and to love doing so. And Jim came out the field really as, a, uh, as an outsider at first, drawn in by a desire to understand the games his son was playing, um, which is a really wonderful uh, impetus to do something. When he found, uh, what he found when he got there was informed, of course, by his expertise. Um, since he looked at games through the lens of literacy and situated embodied learning. 
And the aspect of games that he found was rare and magical. And like any good player, he took that treasure and transformed it into an even more powerful resource, an idea of games as engines of learning that has fueled discussion that is intensely important, not only to game designers and designers of education, but to anyone interested in learning and the future of learning. We're very pr privileged to have James Paul G the Mary Lou Fulton Presidential Professor of Literacy Studies at Arizona State University here today to speak with us about games, learning, and the looming crisis in higher education. And after his talk, we're equally privileged to have our own Henry Jenkins, the Provost Professor of Communication, Journalism, Cinematic Arts, and Education to respond uh, to Jim's uh, talk. Uh, and now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome James Paul G. Okay, thank you very much for that, Tracy. That was really nice. I do prefer usually to walk around while I talk, but um, I could get my retirement paid for by falling off here and suing you. <laughs> I, can't see them. Um, I actually am glad to have been invited here because I've gotten very interested in the crisis of colleges. I got interested in this way. I went to a summit. Uh, that was held in an incubator for all sorts of people who want to sell things to colleges or want to see colleges as a market. And it was all, you know, and, and people who had started a lot of businesses. And all of them argued that in the future, in the not too distant future, about 3,000 American colleges will go out of business. And that the shape of college is changing radically. I mean, for all sorts of reasons that I don't even want to take time on because we could do the whole talk on it. You know, they're up against the market. Right, they're getting expensive. Um, they uh, kids, you know, college kids don't like them much uh, anymore. Um, one of the things, if you think about it, we used to think importantly that colleges were there's there's some level of education where you actually choose to go to it. They don't force you to do it. Right, you're forced to go to school in elementary school, but college you chose. But you know, this quote is interesting because. Now that we have this kind of political line that everybody should go to college or you aren't going to get a job, we're simply turning college into another forced level of schooling. And in a sense, there's a paradox, we're not sending people to college anymore. And what we'll see in this talk, and what you can certainly see in a lot of Henry Jenkins' work, choice is pretty damn important to learning, right? And so there is a profound paradox of how do you make uh, college something lots of people can go to? Uh, democratize it, but still make it an arena of choice and not just a credentialing system. Now, um, I'm sure you guys have all seen the study that came out on Academically Adrift, which argues that about 70% of students in colleges are not learning very much. I've taught for 40 years, and uh, that's not the least bit surprising to me. In many colleges, because of this forced nature, you know, I got to go there to get a degree, that the people are there, and they, in interviews, they're there to socialize, they're there to get the credential, they're not particularly committed to the learning. And as you know, a lot of colleges, especially the ones that are not as prestigious, can't really engage in rigorous evaluation of their students because they'll just take their money to another, another college. Place, that's not true of places like Harvard and Yale, although they give all A's, but Harvard and Yale could waterboard their students, right? I mean, you could say you got waterboarded here and they'd still have no trouble <laughs> filling it up. But the other colleges have to do more than waterboarding. And by the way, we're the same with many undergraduates would choose the waterboarding over the lecture. Um, now, I, I don't want to belabor that stuff because I don't think that's the deepest problem colleges face. I mean, colleges are so screwed, you could talk about them having many problems. But the interesting thing about this, when you're this bad off and you've spoken to it so little, right? Every college has an office to innovate better teaching and do stuff that once a year sponsors somebody to talk. And that's it, right? Uh, so it's, but then it becomes a very fascinating time of possibility, not just peril, if you actually say, we got to break the mold here, we got to do something. So let, me, uh, so let me try to get at what I think the root problem is. It isn't just the ones that have been bandied about. And uh, we can start uh, with this guy, Charles Darwin. Uh, Darwin was a guy who called himself a naturalist and an amateur. And it's interesting that even in his time, his so-called bulldog, Huxley, 
uh, wrote a lot of stuff saying, I don't like those amateurs and those naturalists. You know, you've got to be a professional scientist. You've got to be connected to a university. Um, and so Darwin was of typical character in the 19th century. That is an amateur who, of course, revolutionized science. And he was not a typical character of the 20th century. So for the 20th century, this picture should have out on it. He's out. There hasn't been a Darwin around for a long time. Uh, what did we get? Alan Greenspan. See, Alan Greenspan typifies what universities, as we know them in the 20th century, were meant to produce, uh, even at the cost of you know, producing them so, and then not teaching the undergraduates, you know, letting them subsidize the graduate students. He is what? He is an expert. No one would have called this guy an amateur, right? In fact, he was the leading expert in economics of his time, and he ran the economic structure of America for, for decades. Right? This guy is no trivial guy. Now, I predict, and I know I'm going to win this prediction, because if I, nobody does it, I'll do it. There's going to be a book that comes out on him called The Last Expert. Because what happened? You, you, are you aware that we had a financial crisis in 2008? <laughs> okay. um, you will be soon. Uh, the uh, thing about that crisis is this guy was running the ship during all those years. In fact, he encouraged people to buy, to, to refinance into balloon mortgages. He encouraged them to do that. Now, when the whole system collapsed, and we're talking about a collapse on the order of the Great Depression, what did this guy do? He went to Congress and said, nothing in my 40 years of learning economics prepared me for this. I have no idea why this would happen. He said, I've always assumed that the market would give rise to the best outcome and that no business person would ever do anything purposely that would hurt their company. Now, I said, send me a postcard, Alan. Have you ever been with human beings? <laughs> right? I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know that the financial crisis was caused is a complex system, a perfect storm that could never have been understood by one discipline. This guy had to know something about human psychology, about the way markets interact with social organizations and media, and the way in which you know, laws either encourage be good behavior or bad behavior. But he saw everything through a disciplinary lens as the expert, and then at the end of his career went to Congress to say, and I never saw it coming. That type of expertise today, which in fact is what we lionize, I mean all of us with PhDs thought that's what we were becoming, hopefully not as dangerous as him, but thought we were becoming that. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is, this type of expert today is dangerous because, and studies show this, they undervalue what they don't know. And they're now t talking about complex systems like environmental stuff, global warming, the environmental economy, civilization clashes, through one lens when it's a complex system, right, that requires a whole different way to look at it. So it's pretty clear that for the 20th century, just like Darwin would have had out on him for the 20th century, he would have had in, but now we have to change his in to out. He's gone, right? He's dangerous. Now, the interesting thing is, what I want to now tell you is something is arising in the world. And in one way to put it is Darwin is coming back. We can change his out to in. Except that if I had a picture to put up, that person would not be necessarily male, necessarily old, and, or an Anglican cleric, or rich. In other words, we are bringing back loads of people as Darwin, and I'm gonna, at the end, problematize this by saying, I don't even know what we should call these people. But I want you to realize that why this is relevant to college when we run through this, is I wanna argue to you, you thought your competition was the University of Phoenix or it was the next higher university. Your competition is, is if we ever don't need the credential from college, these people will put you out of business because the only thing they don't have to give is a credential. And Henry knows this, there's a bunch of people thinking of ways for them to give credentials. So your, I'm gonna show you your competition for the 21st century. And uh, it's, not on, it's not the University of Phoenix. Okay, well, let's start with, what, is, what in the 21st century does a complaint letter? You know, have you ever written a complaint letter? Right, you know, you know uh, schools used to teach you how to write letters. So let's look what a complaint letter. So this is a, this is a person playing World of Warcraft. Uh, we always have to ask this, how many people play World of Warcraft? Thank God somebody does. World of Warcraft is the most popular massive multiplayer game. Thousands of people play it. 
And it's a massive role-playing game, which means that each person in it can choose a different character with different skills and then has to interact with all the other skills of the other people. So underlying, that is, underlying this game is a massive statistical model that, that everything you do has to be computed what will happen, how much you'll get for it, what its effect is in, in relationship to every other people's statistics. I mean, it's a massive statistical model. So because you could be, you know, you could be a priest and heal, and you could be a shaman and do a particular type of damage, and you're a warrior, you do a different type of damage. They want to be sure that while each person can be a different skill, there's enough balance so whatever character you choose, you can still be successful. So what they do, they really work hard to be sure no one type of character gets an advantage over another, you know, with the people that did that in the real world, right? <laughs> uh, they nerf so they nerf character. They sometimes weaken a character. So at one time, this guy, he was playing a shaman, and they nerfed his shaman, so he thinks they weakened it, and he's pissed. So he's writing a complaint letter. He's, his letter is an experiment. He says, he puts, he says I, he's now going to describe an experiment he did. A damage meter mod was used. And I was giving all the methodology. I used this mod. The tests were light. You know, you don't need to know what this means. That's the point that you don't. Um, quartz was used in all tests along with the macro stop cast and cast lightning bolt. Then there's a footnote. Uh, then he's talking about the meter parsing that he did to get the results. Then he's talking about the servers he used. Then he's talking about which specs his character had so it's going to be controlled. Then here's the first <laughs> test. Here's the second test. Here's the third test. Then he says, at present, this is one of the worst DPS that's damaged per second nerfs in the World of Warcraft history. Standing at 180.44 DPS loss or a 16.39% damage loss. So he's complaining. <laughs> uh, with the current build, an elemental shaman brings nothing to the table. Please don't leave us like this, Blizzard. He's writing the company a complaint letter, and he knows more about the statistics that underlie uh, lies it. He's actually challenging them that they're not the expert, he's the expert. And he's using what we see as a scientific experiment. Right? He's doing what scientists are supposed to do. And you should be saying, oh my god, this guy is doing what a scientist do. Shouldn't he be doing it in college? Or shouldn't he be doing it on something important? He's doing it about a nerfing a shaman. Okay? And by the way, Blizzard writes the guy back and says, well, you know better than we do. You're right. Got that statistic wrong. They do it all the time. In fact, one guy embarrassed Blizzard so badly in a meeting, just a fan got up and knew so much more about the statistical underpinnings. This is a game, by the way, that makes billions. How many times have you seen billionaires who say some everyday guy is right? One guy embarrassed him so badly they made him a character in the game. Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, wow. I mean, you, I want you to first think, wait, this guy is doing the sort of thing we would associate with college, we'd associate with professions, we'd associate with science, but he's doing it as a complaint letter. Right Now, to go further to show you, I, I, because I'm identified with this early book on games and some other book on games, people have said that I'm advocating we should teach through games. I'm advocating no such thing. Um, in fact, games aren't even games uh, uh, today. I'm advocating teaching through what I'm going to call now, uh, and make it up in honor of myself, a big G game. <laughs> Now, what is a big G game? Well, you know, when games first started, people said they were all social, they were to socially isolate children. They'd sit there and just by themselves in a dark room, and that's how I play. But everybody else <laughs> plays socially, right? And what designers have realized is the game you made, the piece of software, is actually only a setup to get people to start to talk and engage with each other to take it further. That is to create. Uh, what I'm going to call later a passion or affinity space. Right now, we just call it a learning community, right? Now, let me give you an example. How many people have played Portal? How many people have seen all the Portal 2 signs around town? Did you wonder what it was? Portal is this wonderful game in which, by the way, if you haven't played it, do play it. You have to kind of get a, a tacit understanding of the physics of the world you're in, because you can make a port, one Portal. Uh, Obama's calling me. He said he'd call. He's never, never true. Um, the, uh, <laughs> you go in one portal, you come out the other, and they obey certain laws of physics, like the law of conservation of momentum. So what you're really doing in this game is playing with the physics of the world to solve problems. And, so, and this is just pure entertainment, right? 
So what, uh, what people would say as a learning game, right, you know, say, well, this isn't a learning game because, you know, well, sure, you know, you, you're catching on to what it means, the conservation momentum as you feel your own surrogate body go through it. You don't learn any physics. You can't say any physics. I mean, this is a toy. Well, it's not a toy once people catch on to it because then they do stuff like this. They write wikis with all the physics in it. They get together in a community of people to figure out all the physics. Then they mod the game for a different physics. You see, the point is, the big G game is that game, Portal, plus all of the incitement to social interaction, participation, and production you've given rise to when you've turned people on to go do it. See, so once the guy's doing this stuff, you say, well, I guess he did learn some physics. He didn't learn it from the game. The game was preparation for future learning to go into a community to get turned on to physics, to produce physics. Again, not to make a bomb, something useful, but to uh, simply uh, meditate on portal. Right? Now, the, po the thing here is what's important. When you're going to teach game-like learning, it means you build a game, or what, what educators used to call a curriculum, and you build a learning community of a certain sort, which I'll talk about later around it, right? Um, and you have to be a designer of community as much as you're a designer of curriculum. Tracy has to worry about what her players do with each other, not just what they do with the game. Right? If, her, if she wants her game to go on, you know, there are games that have been dead for years. Their community has kept them alive, reskinned them, they're still going. Now, uh, this is embarrassing because uh, this is advertisement for the product, for Portal. It's an advertisement for a capitalist company, a big company, to sell their product. And they say, this game is designed to change the way players approach, manipulate, and surmise the possibilities in a given environment. What it's saying is, we're going to give you a tool. You've never seen this tool, the portal tool. And it will make you look at the environment. In a complete, you'll see affordances and possibilities in the environment entirely differently. You'll surmise new possibilities for accomplishing problem solving and action in the world by us just giving you this tool. Wouldn't this be, I mean, could you imagine a state that had this as their educational vision? We will give kids tools that will let them surmise new possibilities to solve problems in the world. To me, that would be my mission statement in the world now since we don't solve any problems, right? Um, this is, they're saying, hey, I got this commercial toy. A lot of fun to have, see new possibilities in the world around physics. It seems to me, I mean, I, I, it kind of embarrasses me that an educator didn't write that. But I can't even imagine an educator writing it. Um, see, that's the point of getting a tool. The t every t by the way, what's, what is a what's the difference between a physicist and a linguist? Is they have different tools, and therefore they can act in the world in different ways, and they see the world in different ways. The real power is not just those tools. It's seeing both of them. It's juxtaposing them. All right, well, so. Now I'm going to show you a social studies assignment that occurred in no school. Not a, this, is, this, again, is completely out of school. And by the way, they would never call it this because then they wouldn't have done it. Here's the best-selling game in history. Anybody played this game? The Sims? Best, see, you all think from the press that Grand Theft Auto is the best. You, know, you think violent games are. They're not. This thing has outsold Grand Theft Auto many times over. And this is a community simulator. You make up a family. You lead their lives, you build the houses, you, you, know, you do everything like that. You, you, you can kill people, but it's hard. Uh, I asked a kid once, I mean, because I kept saying, here's a nonviolent game, and a kid in the audience said, that's not true. You can kill people in the Sims. I said, yeah, how? He said, here's what I did. I built a swimming pool. I didn't put any stairs out of it, and I coaxed one of my Sims into it. <laughs> So it's a violent game, I mean, you know. Um, <laughs> now, one of the things, just as I told you, because people play games, if they get a passion for it, they begin to organize learning, and often it goes well beyond the game. So one thing people do in The Sims is you can use 3D engines to design houses, clothes, environments, and many people do the designing and don't even play the game anymore. Then you give the designs to everybody around the world who put it in the actual game, and you become a free employee for Will Wright, right? You're, you're making stuff free, giving it away free. They put it in Will Wright's game. He doesn't have to make it. He takes the money home, and you take the satisfaction home. It's win-win. Capitalist win-win. All right, but one other thing that... Um, this, so this is a ch one thing the Sims players like to do, and these are, by the way, this is, this is a, from a community that has 12-year-old girls and 70-year-old women in it. And this is a British 30-year-old player who has given a challenge to the other players to say, 
I want you to live a life in The Sims that mimics nickel and dime. Has anybody read nickel and dime? You read more than you play games, I can see that. Um, uh, it's about how hard it is to be poor. And uh, so the goal of this is, uh, did I not, the goal is you have to, you have to get your kids all the way through uh, life out of the house without being hurt or taken away. Uh, you have to survive and you, have to, and you get a bonus if they go to college, you'd like that, right? And um, the thing about this, this is not at all easy to do in The Sims because it's a commercial product and it isn't fun being poor. The game is made to be able to allow you to live fun lives. Right, you've all read McGonagall's book, uh, Reality is Broken. She says, you know, you play games because reality sucks so much. Here, <laughs> this person's saying, let's take the fun game and make it about poverty. So with, to do this, she had to, so it doesn't, like for example, you can get a genie lamp that gives you any wish you want. That's disallowed if you're gonna be poor. <laughs> um, so she has to state pages of rules that will make the simulation work to really bring out what it's like to lead the life of a poor single parent. And what's really interesting, by the way, there's another, if you can pass the challenge, and by the way, many mothers and daughters play it together. If you can pass the challenge, because The Sims has, you can actually use um, uh, something like Photoshop to, to you, take the pictures of your Sims and then write pages with them. You have to also, when you finish, write a graphic novel that tells what happened to your poor family, how it interacted with the rules she made, and how it w was resisted by the simulation that Wright made. Okay, so here's an example of one of her rules. No cheats except move objects to remove bugged items. In particular, no catching, mother load, max motives, or anything that aids survival. No special objects that will make your Sims life easier. Right, notice she's gotta have a lot of technical skills. She's gotta know what technical aspects of the programming have to be overcome. Uh, then she has to give some, some rules about how people interact. The rule that is most cruel that she gives is no quitting without saving. See, us gamers, there's a little secret, and when we lose, we just quit and don't save it so we don't have to pay the price. She's saying, you know, poor people don't get to do that. They don't get to quit without saving. It's always saved, so you can't do that. So she states a whole uh, mess of rules um, in this, and then the people play the challenge. They write the, the graphic novels, and she gets email like this. I was a single parent, or I am a single parent. This captured the experience Totally. One woman says, I'm going to save it so when my kid grows up, I can show him this because it'll tell him what it was like. Now, this is not a realistic simulation of poverty. It is, a, as she says, it is a simulation meant to capture the feel of poverty with a tool. That, so she has to have technical skills, emotional skills, social skills, aesthetic skills, narrative skills, and she has to constantly serve as the, the master of play as she answers all their questions about what's legal and what's not. And then in the end, you know, people uh, play this, it's very hard, they love it. Now, ask, would, if, if your high school teacher gave that as a social studies assignment, would that be a good assignment? I think it would be, you have to have a lot of, you have to learn the technical skills under the, in the game, you have to be able to mod the game, you have to be mod social intelligence, you have to do role play, you have to think about poverty, you have to think about what factors make, you know, interact to make it hard, and then you have to write a graphic novel about it. Seems to me a good assignment. People are doing it for fun, right? Probably if you asked them to do it in school, they wouldn't do it, right? They're doing it for fun. Now, the other thing I like about this is notice that it doesn't, we have all this mania about STEM. You know, we're losing to the Chinese. We're losing to the uh, Koreans in math and science. We gotta put a lot of money in math. Notice, by the way, in this type of enterprise, she doesn't, you don't separate high technical skills, which she's got, from aesthetic skills and civic thinking. They're, they're married. And they are in most popular culture now. The divides that science is here and aesthetics is there and ethics is there, that's a, that's a baby boomer deal, right? Now, let me tell you one more example, a couple more examples. You know, we academics theorize, right? And it's supposed to be high status to theorize. Uh, but now in these communities, which I'm gonna call passion and affinity groups later, uh, people theorize all the time and again, they're not professionals and they're not doing it for what we see as a deep thing. So one thing that since World of Warcraft is so complicated statistically, um, that it has a whole community of players who do what they call theory crafting. They completely figure out the statistics, then they show how you could improve them, 
um, and then they argue over them, and then they mathematize them. And then for people who are dumb, you know, who don't know any mathematics or statistics, they make a little tool that computes all the statistics for them while they're playing so that they can have a statistician next to them, right? This is a 3D tool that computes all the statistics for certain things, all that theorizing. See, wouldn't it be great if you said to an academic, why don't you, you know, you think you're such a good theorizer. Here's the test. Make a tool that would let somebody who doesn't know your theory understand it and use it, right? Now, what happens here, that's called, uh, uh, this is a picture. See, if you don't, you don't game, it's very hard to know what this is a picture of. But, and I'm going to try to tell you, very, every gamer knows what this is a picture of, but it's a very, very weird picture. This is the game World of Warcraft. Now, you know, you know this. What you, what you normally see in a game like World of Warcraft is just little people running around, right? They're elves. Elves are people, too. And, you know, they're just <laughs> running around. And they're doing their interactions. They're fighting or whatever they're doing. They're in groups. But you notice in these pictures here, there's something really bothersome because you can't see the little people very well. What's all this junk on the front? Well, those are those mods. These are things the community of players have made that show you different statistical things going on so that you can, while you're playing, think about what strategy you want to use with the other people you're playing with and theorize right in the moment you're acting. Now, these people who use this stuff and throw it up on the screen have gotten so good at the game, they don't need to see the game. What they're looking at is their tools that tell them the theory they should be applying to do their strategy. The theory has eaten the practice. Now, you know, in education, people say, well, you know, if you, if you learn through experience and concrete, you will never generalize, you'll never get abstract. Got... Not true. These people learn through just running around and then get so good they build tools to capture their theories, their strategies, their plans. Then they slap them up to do them in place, and pretty soon all they're doing is playing their theory. And then they don't play the game, they go do theory crafting. Right? What, if, what if that was your major? What if you got somebody to go from there to a new statistical model that eradicated uh, poverty or something? Okay, science, today's world. Anybody played Folded? See, Henry and... Wrong crowd. No, well, it is the wrong crowd, I guess. But that's my point. Really, it is my point because th this crowd's going to replace you. They are. They're going to replace me, by the way, too. I'm not exempting myself. Fold It is a, a game where people fold proteins. It's like a casual game. And now folding proteins, you know, finding out how they fold is really a big deal. Why? Because it can cure cancer or it can cause cancer. You've, you, it, proteins uh, have a certain effect depending on how they fold it, what shape they went into. Uh, it could cause cancer or cure it, but it, the trouble is this, there's a billion possible shapes it could fold into. So scientists, you know, want to discover the shape of a particular protein either to make one synthetically to cure a disease or to know what it's doing in your body. And the only way they can do that is they have these mega computers, you know, computer over the whole wall that just runs through billions of possibilities. Now, you know it's likely shape when you hit the lowest energy level then that's probably the shape. So what you're really trying to do is the computer's looking for the lowest energy state. So the game, let show, it's just like, you know, it shows you a little toy set of links and proteins, and every time you fold, it'll show you what that fold did to the energy state, and then you try to find patterns to get to the lowest energy state. That's all you do, right? It's just like snood, it's a casual game. However, uh, just like with uh, the other stuff, People really get into this, and then they begin to go not only debate, notice what this guy's doing. He's not, they're learning all about proteins, which, by the way, is a big, complicated enterprise, and there's whole sheets of stuff in this game. If you want to learn about proteins, you can learn everything you want. This guy is suggesting not only stuff about proteins, but a way the game could be improved to actually make it a better tool for science. Now, these gamers, and they're just gamers, so you could say, well, they're just playing around. They go into a contest each year with the scientists. The scientists have their supercomputers uh, to see, and it sees uh, who can find new protein shapes the quickest, the best, to get the best ones. Last year, the top 10 settings, five of the top 10 winners, five of them were the gamers. Five of the gamers beat the supercomputers. See, the day when nine does, those scientists with their PhDs are gone. They're gone, right? So uh, five out of 10 now, playing a casual game, discover new shapes of protein that could cure your cancer. And they don't have PhDs, 
fact, there's a beautiful, I would show it if the internet ever worked in America, but there's a beautiful <laughs> little um, thing where a British woman who, you know, has some lowly job comes home and plays this and has discovered some really good things. She said, I'm a smart person. I, I have some ability and I never get to use it. This game lets me feel like I make a contribution, I have abilities, I'm doing something worthwhile. By the way, nobody's paid. Okay. All right, so what is going on here? Well, in a way, what's going on is, Dar you know, Darwin was an amateur guy who did his science by having no institution or degree except a ministry degree, but he was in a network of people at, that, that communicated through letters, all of whom, were, and by the way, their big thing, just like this, was what? Collecting beetles. But these guys, you know, Darwin was, every one of them, I know it's a British thing, my family's British, they're really big on beetles. And <laughs> that's, well, why do you think the beetles were called the beetles, right? Um, so the is, these, these people, they're just out there collecting beetles, writing letters, you know, I got this beetle with a green head, you gotta see it. And, and Darwin's sitting around with the beetles and he's going on this boat trip and they're mailing stuff to each other. And uh, he discovers one of the biggest discoveries in science. Um, it's not unlike what these people are doing. They're amateurs. They're just interacting with each other, although with a much more powerful medium, because now they have these tools that will produce knowledge. Um, and they're doing stuff that all of us think is, well, it sounds a little bit better than collecting beetles, but it doesn't sound that great. So we've got Darwin back, except that some of these people are 15-year-old girls. Some are 70-year-old women. Some are you know, very poor. Some are very rich. You don't need to be a minister anymore. You could have that Walmart job and come home and do this. So in one of my recent books, I, I try, what these, the groups, the value added here is you have a piece of a game, could be a curriculum, and it's, it sparks an interest that creates a passion to do it with other people at the level of actually producing competitive knowledge with the so-called professionals. And we, there's a lot of these communities, but uh, we wondered in this book, which are the ones that produce the really best stuff? And in a humane way, because by the way, there are some that are just nasty to each other and they still produce great stuff because nastiness is good for some people. They really like it, but I don't. So um, we wanted to look at communities that were not nasty, but that produce these really core results. I mean, one, one a 70-year-old shut-in woman uh, learns to design for The Sims because her six-year-old granddaughter wanted her to make a purple potty. She has to master Adobe Photoshop 3D engines, and she so liked the group she was in, she decided to make a few more things. And then she decided to give them away to people in the world. She now has 17 million customers, and she has over one million thank yous in her guest book. 45 years as an academic, I've been thanked 14 times. <laughs> She's got one million. Right, so what are the, how do people organize themselves to do this? Now, this, you know, this is a higher ed deal. And so I'm gonna make this hypothesis. For those colleges that are going, gonna go out of business, which is not yours, because you're getting prestigious enough that you probably can waterboard some of your students. Um, uh, this is how a college ought to be designed, not just taking what's out there, but let's do these that get us the next Darwin's. Right? Not, not, don't just get the guys who can do do doctor damage. Let's go get the new Darwins and the new people who solve global warming and all of that. All right. One of the things that intrigue me about these spaces is, first of all, they, the people are, and partly because it's on the internet, so you don't know what people are like, they're really organized around a shared passion. If you want to design for The Sims, you want to do theory crafting, you don't even know if the people are young, old, black, or white, unless they want to tell you. Um, most powerfully, they're not age graded. The thing is, that you, the ones that work best is when every age, 12 to 70, you're in there. Um, the, the also, they do not segregate, think how unlike schools this is, newbies and masters and everybody in between together, right? It's not, there's you, only an expert, only a newbie, you know. The newbie can go lurk in the biggest site if they want to do it. So uh, the other thing is players produce and Joseph, you, it, this, they're always set up in such a way that in this community, if you, don't, if you want to be more than just a participant, you want to make something and you want to send it to Will Wright, they will help you do that because the, the, the point of it is you should be a producer. They encourage 
specialist knowledge in general. You're expected to be, get something that you're really good at and be an absolute specialist in it, but you're also expected to understand all the other people's specialties and what they do. So if you make houses and the other person designs environments, you know, uh, geography, you're supposed to be able to work with that person because you've got to put your house on something, right? Uh, and so you have to share... Uh, you have to have deep skill, but also the ability to integrate your knowledge with shared knowledge. Um, they encourage you to know a lot, but what's interesting is on the site, we, we have this 70-year-old woman who's a big, big star now. She's considered a rock star in design. Um, somebody wrote her and said, are you an expert? And she said, no. Uh, the, that site, naming the Sims community, she said, the expertise is in the community. I'm an expert because I know how to go in that community and learn something new if I have to. See, and one of the nasty sites said, that woman's not really an expert. Experts have it all in their head. She doesn't. She had to go back in there and ask somebody. Her, she's saying, you, you really missed what an expert is. Right? You're an Alan Greenspan is what she's saying. Right? The expertise isn't in the individual alone. It's in the other people and your ability to collaborate with them. It encourages also dispersed knowledge. That is, it links to every other possible site so that it's not, this is very important because if you don't link your passionate community to others, it becomes an isolated community where everybody agrees with each other. But if you link in all possibilities, then outside knowledge is flowing in all the time. It honors tacit knowledge, not just explicit knowledge. By the way, school doesn't honor tacit knowledge at all. Um, there are always many different routes to participation. You do not have to participate in the same way. By the way, one interesting thing is these sites, there's a lot of research on them now, they operate by what's called the Pareto Principle. That is 80-20. 80% of the people do 20% of the stuff and 20 do 80%. Right? That means everybody's contribution gets in there and counts, but some people are contributing a lot. Unlike schools where you get the bell curve, right? This, the curve of this learning is the Pareto Principle. It means, by the way, you want more than one of these so that everybody can be in the 20% and the one that they choose to. Um, there are lots of different routes to status. This is crucial. And uh, uh, leadership is porous. Some days you lead, some days Henry leads, some days somebody else leads, right? Because you've got your specialty. And um, that's it. That's the features that they have. Now, here's the end. So this is the paradigm by which our schooly system, K to college, tends to work. We think of teaching as instructing. Somebody is telling you stuff. Learning is learning content, facts, information. Assessment is done after the learning. It's the final exam or it's the test they send from Illinois. And at the center of what we do is articulation, your ability to write and talk about stuff. Right? That's what schooling in America has been for a long time. One of the things we've known since the 70s is it doesn't correlate with problem solving. Right? You do that, you certainly can get content learned, but the people can't. So this, is, this was a cottage industry since the 70s. You go into a class in college physics. They've all got A's. You give them a problem like how many forces are impacting in a coin when you throw it in the top, and when it's in a trajectory, and when you've thrown it in the air. And you know that they could deduce the answer from Newton's laws of motion, and, you, and they can all write down Newton's laws of motion. And yet 75% of them get it wrong. They cannot apply their content or their theories to the world to solve problems. Now, can the World of Warcraft people apply their theories to solve problems? They're sitting right on top of the problem. All right, this model is teaching is not instructing. It's designing the game and the passionate community, the passionate affinity space, designing experiences for people to have. Learning is about problem solving that recruits facts and information so it's learned, but to solve a problem so you get both. Assessment is not done after the learning. It's done in the learning. It, you don't get to go to the next level, or you don't get somebody to say your house in The Sims was good until you, were, you honored the standards of the community. There's no, it, it, once you have 17 million customers and you're the model designer in the site, nobody says, let's give Tabby Lou a test, right? The, the assessment and learning are together. And articulation, interesting enough, that ability to talk and write about what you do is not done necessarily in the classroom or the curriculum. It's done in that passionate space where people are discussing the experiences they've had and where they are modding them and taking them uh, to the future. Now, if people can do this to make doctor damage for World of Warcraft and produce statistical knowledge, if we could get rid of the Carnegie unit, get rid of our individual classes and department labels that Aristotle could have invented, then we can welcome 
the new amateur. I don't even like that word, the new Darwins, because that's what it's going to be. We're not going to need credentials to be smart. One of two things is going to happen. If you do this in college, you will solve that problem I talked about earlier, that college is supposed to be choice, but if it's just about credentials, that you didn't choose it. If you, have, if you go from people's interest to a passion, then they've chosen it. Right? It becomes a realm of choice. If you don't do that, people will create these for every possible thing, and they will invent a badge system, give credentials, and all those colleges that, can, that can't get away with just waterboarding students will go out of business. Thank you. Well, I am honored to have a chance to follow after James G. It's obviously a daunting task. Uh, he's a provocative thinker and an incredibly articulate person, an incredibly generous person. Uh, I'm here, this is sort of a coming out party for me in a way because I'm here in, in an education setting here at USC having just had the word education added at the end of the list of, of fields that USC believes I have some knowledge on. Uh, and I would not be here in this space, I think it's fair to say, if it was not for Jim G and the community of people around him that I've been learning about education over the last decade. People like Kurt Squire and Constance Steinkuhler and Rebecca Black and Katie Clinton have all, uh, have all been key and people who've helped me to think about education in new ways. That at heart, I've been a media scholar and a media scholar whose core original research was on fan communities. And what I want to do in the time I've got here today is talk, sort of broaden our discussion of what Jim just called passion and affinity groups to talk not just about gamers, but, but about fans as another population that is undergoing a similar process of learning that I think we need to incorporate and engage with through the educational process. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've seen of, of looking at fans over the years and how we're applying that in work that I'm doing now with the Robert F. Kennedy schools here in LA where we've begun to develop after school programs and as of the summer we'll be doing teacher training programs to try to apply some of the implications of what we've just heard about. So my, my research group here at MIT, at USC, <laughs> I just left MIT two years ago, here at USC is called the Center for Participatory Culture and Learning, uh, or PICL as Larry Gross has decided to call it, and it's a useful acronym. Uh, and it's, so for me, I use the term participatory culture. It's really more or less the same thing as what Jim just called passion and affinity groups. I think the differences between them has been much of what I write about has a stronger social connection between its members. And I think fandom is a kind of interesting blurring of, between what Mimi Ito would call interest-driven networks and friendship-driven networks. And that that's an important motivator for the communities I'm looking at. But, and in some cases, Jim has made the argument for affinity spaces being spaces where the social is less important than shared task. And that's the biggest distinction I've seen over time between the ways we're using those two, two words. But what I started discovering, the first thing you discover about fans is that they're a community deeply dedicated to textual analysis, right? That this is a group that reads very, very closely, that engages in sophisticated arguments about what they read. And by reading, I mean, reading books, watching television shows, watching movies, and develop ever more elaborate tools for mobilizing evidence to support their insights into what they've read. So for the purposes of the discussion, I'm gonna focus this on Harry Potter, because I, I, I've sort of been looking lately at Harry Potter as a text, a pretty complex text, uh, several thousand pages if we add up all seven of, of the books. Uh, which tell an elaborate story that takes place over a decade of time that involves a sophisticated set of characters that involve many of which have complex motives, uh, deep histories, some of which are hinted at the book, some of which are developed through secondary text, including those developed by the author. So there's a lot involved in reading Harry Potter. I just got through reading an a really interesting manuscript for a book that will be out in another couple of months by Becky Hare Shepherdson, who's a graduate of USC, talking about a book called uh, Teaching Harry Potter. And it really describes how a variety of classroom teachers found the way into the Harry Potter books through uh, and connecting them to the passions and interests of their students, including students that were unlikely readers of Harry Potter books. 
So when she, one of the teachers she profiles teaches in an African American classroom, another in a Sp predominantly Spanish classroom, both of whom initially thought that Harry Potter was a book for white kids and discovered that there were ma the ways in there about cultural difference and themes there about entering into a new cultural environment, being an immigrant of such into a world whose rules are, you don't fully understand, but which is placing expectations on you, but also looking down on you for being um, a mixed blood uh, is one of the terms that get crops up often in the Harry Potter books. Uh, and what she describes there is the tension between the passion-driven learning these teachers are involved with and school policies which eventually prohibited all of those teachers from using Harry Potter in the classroom because they didn't meet the expectations of standardized curriculum and standardized testing and gradually what was very valuable programs this book describes were crushed by current school policies which make it very hard to bring these kinds of fanish engagements into the classroom. My own work though in fan culture went beyond that and in this sense it connects with the work that Rebecca Black has been doing on the ways in which fan writing communities become incredible support networks that help people acquire composition and communication skills. Right, so many of you know fan, there are hundreds of thousands of stories written about Harry Potter, many of them, um, them full-length novels. Uh, one, of the student, one of my grad students back at MIT was someone who started writing novels at 13 and 14. Uh, was editing and giving advice to other people by about 15 or 16, helped to create the major pub around which Harry Potter fan fiction was published, working mostly with adults, but uh, developing a self-confidence and a skill set that served her well and made her one of the best grad students I've ever, ever worked with. But what Rebecca Block tells us is this space has become particularly important for ESL learners, that is for students who may have a lot of knowledge of a different culture, say fans of Japanese anime who come from Asia, who have a lot of knowledge to contribute to the community, may not have great English language skills, but there's a zone of tolerance that because they have something they can contribute to the work of the community, people will put up with bad English and will give them advice and help them get better, and they're able to mobilize their expertise rather quickly to shape the stories that are emerging from this community. And so what you get is a space where these 14, 15-year-olds writing full-length novels are getting feedback from hundreds of people on what they wrote. And you compare, you know, and I, I, you know, I talk to them about their experiences at school and their frustrations if a teacher would write very good at the top of the story they wrote compared to the hundred, hundreds of letters of response and critique that they got from the fan community. And it was no wonder that they were smuggling stories they were writing into their textbooks in the classroom and trying to write during class because this was where they were learning and this was what was driving them. But my more recent work is looking at this, the same community as a space for civic engagement. Um, and I've just finished a piece about a group called the Harry Potter Alliance, which is an activist group uh, created by a 20-something uh, that has uh, now got 100,000 young people around the world involved in human rights activism in the name of Harry Potter. And they have just raised five cargo planes worth of supplies to send to Haiti. Uh, they've sent 500,000 books to the developing world. Uh, they've registered more than 100,000 people to, uh, to vote uh, and through various get out the vote moves and so forth. They have done incredible things collectively and individually in the name of Harry Potter. So why in the name of Harry Potter? Well, first you need to know about J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling uh, was a member of Amnesty International before she became uh, a, a writer. I mean, she went through a period of unemployment and then she came out of it the other side and everyone says an unemployed woman wrote Harry Potter, but she'd been an activist at, uh, the show, and, at Amnesty International. When she spoke at Harvard's graduation ceremony about four years ago, she spelled out the connection she saw between a political vision coming out of Amnesty International and the representations of a society and time of terrorism, a society grappled with fear, whose government was manipulating the fear, whose press was concentrated in covering up what was going on, whose school system became increasingly repressive and tried to shut down the voices and activities of their students as a way of controlling and constraining resistance to the politics of terror, and which talks about people being sent out to Azcatraz on false ac accusations that talks about the challenges of uh, werewolves being closeted in this society and, and people being made ashamed of their racial backgrounds and so forth. There's a lot in those books. 
what Andrew Slack, the 20-something who created the Harry Potter Alliance, says is, well, also in those books is the theory of youth empowerment, right? That at the core of them for him is Dumbledore's army, this group of young people who got together and on the side out and using the school facilities in an unauthorized way and formed an activist group, went out and confronted the evil that adults weren't ready to deal with and changed the world. And he says that's the story he wants young people to take from these novels, is to take what they're passionate about and mobilize it to cha to, toward social change, toward a kind of civic engagement. And he does it through mobilizing the metaphors, but he also does it through using this, the playful structures of fandom. So that um, one of the things he does, that one of the things that's really important for the world of Harry Potter is the houses. So those of you who read the book know Gryffindor, uh, uh, Slytherin, Ravenclaw, and Hufflepuff. So every Harry Potter fan virtually gets sorted through one or another mechanism into a house. So I'm a loyal Ravenclaw. I'm very proud of my Ravenclaw identity. I even have a Ravenclaw banner hanging in my office over in the Annenberg building because this is an important part of who I am. Well, what the Harry Potter Alliance did was take the house competitions and use them to work collaboratively to get out the vote. And they've participated in various voter drives, especially around equal marriage propositions uh, in Maine, for example, and got thousands of people out to vote by mobilizing the house structure. To, and house structures have leaders, and they stir people on. The house structure has shared values, and they tap those values in order to push people beyond their comfort zone into taking action in the real world. Now, I think this is different from the model of gamification. And Jim and I were corresponding a little over the weekend about what people are calling gamification. And gamification is where you sort of set arbitrary point values on actions in the real world in order to motivate social change. And part of what we've learned after a decade or so of looking at games for learning is learning takes place when the learning grows organically out of the activities the game enables, out of the fantasies that drive the game, out of the things you want to do in the game. But if you simply take a body of knowledge and put a, a game grid on top of it, it doesn't really motivate the deep thinking that Jim G. just was describing for us. And the danger of what people are calling gamification is they give arbitrary point values to arbitrary activities in ways that have a game-like structure to motivate behavior in the real world. But they don't come deeply out of the passions, the interests, the fantasies that are driving them. Whereas the house competitions in the Harry Potter world are first motivated by the social identity of players, that they are empowered as wizards to understand this content world in a particularly strong way and to have strong bonds with each other. And the mapping of the content world onto real world issues is at the core of mobilizing their expertise of fans and allowing them to feel an emotional connection. Part of what the Harry Potter Alliance does for its members is to define clear roles and goals for participation. It does what activist groups rarely do. It teaches you how to, what it is, means to be an activist, why you want to be an activist. It teaches you what you're fighting for and what you're fighting against in very clear terms. And it sets levels of success that are achievable. But within the house structure, as Jim just described, there are different, different ways to succeed and different forms of leadership that emerge. And the Harry Potter Alliance has done a really good job of tapping into that in order to mobilize young people to become activists. Now, there's a lot of literature about young people in, in civic engagement, and it tells us a number of things. It tells us young people are more likely to become activists if their parents are activists or have strong political lives, that young people are more likely to become activists if they have a teacher in, in high school, who and particularly a social science teacher who helps them think about social issues in a more empowered way, that they are more likely to become activists if they go to schools which take their voice into consideration in the core decisions within that school. And they're more likely to become an activist if they belong to social service organizations or social activities after school that support and scaffold them giving back something to their community. What I show, though, is that young people are more likely, young people's political identity gets shaped by early high school, right? That, they're, they're, that those people are not activists by early high school are relatively unlikely to move into the political sphere. Whereas what we're seeing with the Harry Potter Alliance is young people are becoming more politically engaged in high school and early college that who, who had never thought of themselves as political before. And, this, and we've interviewed now 40 people who've been involved with the Harry Potter Alliance. 
and we're tracing their trajectories and trying to understand why the organization does that, how it's supporting it. But what comes out of that, that research is showing us is it's precisely that sense of moving people who are culturally engaged into being civically engaged by tapping their passions and moving, uh, mobilizing them in ways that make it possible for them to act in meaningful ways in the real world. And this is a very powerful learning community. In fact, we're writing up now for, for the Spencer Foundation, trying to see what we learn from this that tells us about civic education in the United States. And I think there's some really interesting insights that will come out of that, that work. So this is not a, G, a big G game, but it is, I would say, a big P play. And maybe big P is less felicitous than uh, big G, but, uh, but, uh, but big P play, I think, is, plays the right word. P is the right thing to emphasize here, because if I think about play, I think, first of all, about the permission we grant ourselves to play, the magic circle which enables us to change our perceptions of the world around us. I think about the process of play, uh, which uh, Eric Zimmerman likes to talk about golf as a game where obviously the most utilitarian way to pay golf is to take the ball, walk up to the hole, and put the ball in the hole. Right? This idea of hitting it with a stick from great distance over traps and so forth, not a very good way to succeed at achieving your goal, but the process is where the pleasure is, and the social engagement around that process is where meaningful activity takes place. P, the big, big P in play is also about passion, right? which motivates this activity. It's about productivity the highly generative nature of these kinds of activities. that are The generativity is not the goal, but it's the byproduct of participating in it in really powerful ways. Um, it's about productivity. Oh, that's what I said, about participation. That is, it's not as much fun to watch someone playing a game as it is, or it is, as it is to participate. And so the, around that is what we, we, in learning sciences, talk about legitimate peripheral participation. There's a period of time where, yeah, I want to watch. I want to understand what play is going on. And at a certain point, I just want to roll up my sleeves and get in the mud and you know, play Quidditch with everyone else. Right? That, that, that process takes over at a certain point. And finally, there's a pleasure which is coupled with learning. And the outcome of combining pleasure with learning is a vital part of that. Now, to pull this back to our college classrooms as I wrap things up, I want us to push us away from romanticizing the digital natives as if every digital native has found his way into their passionate uh, affinity group. They haven't, right? Lots of digital natives are young people who've grown up in the digital age. And keep in mind, many young people grow up in the digital age with having no access to those technologies and those skills and those experience. But even those who do may not have found that pleasure center that motivates them in the way in which we're talking about. And our schools have done nothing to help that process, right? In fact, have done a great deal of damage. And I found that the values, my P's in play, are precisely those things that make young people anxious in an academic setting. Because school's a game, but school is a ga gamification, right? School is, I'm assigning arbitrary point values to certain bodies of knowledge, and if you spit up that answer, you get a point. It's like seals and, and, and fish, you know, jump up, I'll give you, a, give you a fish. That process, I think, over time, has damaged the capacity of our best students, what the system calls the best students, the student to perform in a way that is playful, to engage with their passions. I first started seeing that when we were going into schools with some of the curriculum we developed, and we discovered that bad students had no trouble embracing a more playful and participatory pedagogy. In fact, they, they turned on, they demonstrated capacities that teachers didn't know that they had, they shared knowledge that had been shut out, they, opened, they found their voice fairly quickly when we mobilized what they knew outside the classroom. And we found that the, the, the A students, the ones in the advanced placement test classes, were terrified of the process of changing the rules of the game because they've become very, very good at that game. They know how to hit the score. They know how to rack up the points. They know how to succeed by those standards. And they are terrified of a system that is more open-ended, that's more participatory, that doesn't have clear goals and rules, that allows multiple ways to succeed and few ways to fail, but that they're, they're not sure what to do with that. And I'm seeing, as I engage undergraduates in my lecture classes here at USC, that the impact of that on the students that we're seeing who are been raised with standardized tests and with clearly articulated standards of learning at every step along the way, and who are terrified when you ask them to think for themselves. 
And some of these are people who have, are really, really good at doing this stuff through the passionate communities we talk about that are doing it outside of the school, but they create a mental bifurcation where school require, is this kind of game, the stuff I do with games or fandom or whatnot is this stuff, and there's a wall between them that gives them a certain sense of security that when you tear down the wall, they don't know what to do. So it's so easy to say, let's bring all the stuff into the schools, let's build a more passionate environment, as if all the problem was on the school side, but we've now, by the time they get to college, they have been so trained by the educational processes we're using that if we change the rules without in more of an engagement with the prehistory of those students, we create terror, we don't create pleasure. And I think the consequences of that is Doug Thomas, who wrote a book with John Seeley Brown on a new culture of learning, and I interviewed him for my blog the other week, and he tells in the interview the story of meeting a student about to graduate from USC uh, who was trying to, trying to figure out what to write her thesis on. And he says, well, what are you really passionate about? And she looks at Doug and says, no one's ever asked me that question before. And so that's the product of a standardized educational environment where kids are not asked that question by schools and teachers. And by the time you're asked it, when you're about to graduate from USC and about to write your thesis, it's probably too late. So this is, I think, the real implication of what uh, Jim was just talking about for those of us in the room, whether we're working with high school students or whether we're working with college students, is we've got to bring that stuff in, but we also have to figure out how to deal with the terror and uncertainty. And one of the things games has done very, very well is create those roles, rules, goals, structures that make this activity meaningful, but also give it a shape and allow students to succeed. And that, I think, is what we've got to figure out how to do with our curricular designs. So I'll end there. So should we? So uh, why don't we have a few questions? And I think there's even a microphone. How professional is that? Um, so raise your hand, and the microphone will find you. Person over here. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Diane, for holding the microphone, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you both for for this provocative uh, presentation. So I, I do have a question that I think directly speaks to points you both have just made. Um, I become aware recently of a couple of experiments that have uh, been undertaken. I think Kay Katie Salen is one of them at the New School, but also uh, Dini Grigar and uh, John Barber up at uh, Vancouver where they've developed bad systems uh, in their academic programs. So it sounds like the gamification of education, and yet it ties to something I've been recently uh, realizing when I've looked at my own daughter as she and my son play uh, Michael Jackson's dance experience uh, on the Wii, where they're overjoyed when they can over unlock uh, an educational video that teaches them a new dance move. They're, and I keep thinking, wow, if only I just held off on giving my students writing lessons until they did a certain writing move. <laughs> and then they had earned enough points to get the next exciting lesson in grammar or essay structure or rhetoric. Um, and so I, I feel like this speaks directly to, what, to part of what you're saying in terms of bringing play in. And yet, again, it sort of conflicts with what Henry was just saying about you know, the, the ways in which we've already used this gamification in ways that are sort of meaningless to students and tri trivializes their efforts and creates an artificial system that's not the magic circle, but instead something that, again, is totally disconnected from what they're going to encounter in the rest of, of the real world. So I just wonder, wonder if you can right, speak I don't to think this. It, it contradicts what Henry's saying. It's, it, 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 a badge system, and as I pointed out, this badge system mania could put a lot of colleges out of business because. You know, if you get your chemistry badge from the folding game, you don't need it from the college. But in good game design, the badge is one incentive system, also an assessment system, intricately built into the design of the game, and in no way is duping you. Let me give you an example of gamification, though, where it's more problematic. I, in a kind of Ender's Game way, I go into a workplace, like a call center, and I turn it into, this is true, I turn it into a game, and I let the call center operator, I think, 
the call center operator is going to believe, wow, I made this fun, call center is bad. It looks like it's all a game. Uh, and uh, so it motivates them to do many more calls and to be good. But in fact, what they're really been doing is all that information, instead of being given, the, 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 the boss can collect tremendous amount of information, who's doing what, what the thing is. So it's really, to the boss, a surveillance tool, and to, it's supposed to be, to the player, a game that they're going to be engaged with. But see, one thing we've realized for about 102 years, humans are not good dupes. They figure it out. And so if the badge system is treating you as a dupe, uh, it won't work. And if it's integral to the design of the thing and is far from duping you, it is in fact part of what makes you, because you know, your badges are usually compared to other gamers and it's ranking you and it's part of the system, the social system, I put, where how people know they stand in the community and nobody is manipulating them, then it's good. And that's true of all technologies, right? They can be used for good or bad stuff. So. You can't say gamification or anything else is good or bad. It depends what you do with it. It's just that today there are some people, I think, who are doing it either for surveillance or to evade some of the truths we need to tell about reality. So yeah, my wife is a reigning mayor of Grinders up the street from mm -hmm. USC because she plays yeah, Foursquare. Square. And, it's teach and I now end up having to go to Grinders once or twice a week uh, in order to preserve that status <laughs> within it. And that seems a kind of arbitrary thing to me that I'm trying to be supportive of my wife, but a little confused. But on the other hand, I'm an Eagle Scout, right? And I say it as an active thing because even though I earned my Eagle Scout at 18, the, the notion is that you are still that Eagle Scout as an adult. And an Eagle Scout was, that Eagle badge signifies a range of skills and experiences I completed, some of which are required, some of which are voluntary, so out of which I learned how to teach and learned a lot about learning and a lot about the world. And those badges were another way of signifying what I knew to the grades that I got at school. And sometimes the picture I got on my merit badge sash would look rather different than the picture I had on my report card in terms of my abilities, my interest, what I was willing to dedicate my energy in. So to me, there's, the game, gamification is about arbitrary points, but badges are recognitions of what I've learned and what's motivating me to learn it. And if there's a, they can be used in a superficial way. But if we create a system of informal badges, which wasn't as discriminatory as the Boy Scouts are, on the basis of gender and sexuality and a number of other things, that make it hard for me to sort of fully align myself with Boy Scouts as an organization anymore, that system could give recognition to kids who aren't in structures of learning, who aren't or doing things that are incredibly valuable, like the stuff Jim and I described, but that don't have an, a resume label attached to them. Uh, you know, we've talked about do you put Harry Potter Alliance on your, your college application or does it sound too geeky? Uh, and, but if you had a merit badge for civic participation that described your ability to mobilize voters and, and so forth, that would be a meaningful indicator of what the student had dedicated their, their time to. So I'm actually a pretty firm believer in badges, but it has to be the right kind of system. Oh, um, I just wanted to say that um, I personally participated in a couple of communities um, of game making communities. Um, one of them is called Beyond Engine, and the other one is called RPG Maker VX. And I was just wondering what you, what you guys thought about um, communities centered around exploiting um, people's willingness to to go the extra mile to um, dedicate their time to. Uh, making their own environments and um, confronting problems that would um, make them have to do, you know, testing and make sure that the characters in the game um, occupy, uh, you know, a, a setting where um, all the characters interact properly and they, sure. and they come up with their own um, skill sets and things like that. Well, see, so what you're describing, and this is crucial to these passionate affinity spaces, and I, I tend to call them spaces rather than groups, because it's, it, you, know, you could be in the space by having lurked once, or you could be the biggest participant. I mean, it's, it's hard to say who's a member, and that's part of their strength. But um, it, if you're going to, you, in these things, in the game design communities are a great example, it, the crucial thing to make it real, so these badges are not fake, is you have to be held to professional standards. You don't, have a, you don't have the professional credential, but you're held to high standards. So what you're describing is the sort of iterative testing good game designers do. 
And so you're saying, okay, you, you, are, you are giving just the sort of evidence we need to show that your community is not like grade inflated. In, you know, today you get an A no matter what, you get an A minus, you go and complain. But you're saying, you know, if your characters don't interact correctly, the rest of the people on that site don't say you get a badge or you get any adulation for being a good designer. See, so you're behaving like a professional when at least you look young, you're probably 40, but you know, you, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but you don't have a credential, but you're engaging in the very same practice a professional does. And we know many of these games, see, Portal was designed by a group of students. You know, uh, the best the best selling mod ever, uh, uh, Counter Strike, was done by a group of twenty something people as amateurs. Made a lot of money. It, it's pretty clear all the time that people like you are going to compete with Tracy. The day may come, and it might be next year, that USC says Tracy's expensive. She's a little bit old, and um, <laughs> they give you the job. And why? Because you'll have a portfolio of what you designed. You have a theory of game design, and no one's going to test you by your age at this. They're going to test you by what you've done. But you will have come out of a community that isn't sanctioned by an official institution like USC. And it doesn't have a degree, but that you held the same standards. In fact, you have better evidence that you held to the standards than we have. I, we have a grade and a grade inflated system. You have a game. And it works or it doesn't work. Right. There's somebody there. Oh, there's somebody there. Oh, lots of somebody. Yes. Run to the so depending on whom you talk to, you hear that higher education is the oldest institution other than the church. And we know that in February, Harvard University released a report, um, Pathways to Prosperity, which looked at higher education and very critically and made the, the, um, the point that there may be a middle ground, there may be a middle path. Uh, a lot of middle managers or prospective middle managers do not seek a bachelor's degree. They seek something entirely different. And higher education, in Harvard's view, is missing the point, missing the opportunity that's out there. So I'm wondering how much of that point is actually you know, this structural problem of higher education perhaps not catering to these people that you all discussed initially, those that cannot access higher education. How much of it is that failure versus, say, the, the, the curriculum and the lack of a sort of game? But see, remember the failure you know, when you look at that book that says 70% of the kids aren't learning stuff, that isn't just the kids who had trouble getting into college. That's the kids, many kids who had an easy time getting into college. College is failing with the good students and the bad ones. 30% are doing fine, and they're referred to in some of the reviews of the study as the monks. They actually read, you know, they go into their room and they do fine. But the rest of them are not doing that. And so this is not a problem of just the people who can't have a hard time getting into college. It's now kind of, just as high school in America, even the kids with good grades in high school don't like it. The baby boom didn't do very well in school, but they liked it. They were kind of naive. But now kids who do well in school by high school don't like it. So it's not a problem just of the access. But it's also a problem of a direct contradiction. You know that the majority of kids across the country major in things that are job related, like business engineering. They're, they're getting to be 20% of all the majors are in business. Okay? So college is trying simultaneously to be a, vo a voc ed school and this medieval liberal arts thing where people study stuff not because of the beetle collector. The guy like Darwin went out and said, beetles are great, I have a passion, we're gonna study them. Because what we thought at sometimes, you let enough people go out after beetles and you get some major discoveries. You, you don't want them. So we've got the voc ed thing and we've got the beetle thing. And a lot of people don't wanna do the beetle thing because you told them this was a good credential. You said the reason you should come is it'll make you richer. What I'm saying is, I don't want to do the voc ed thing. You can go do it. I want to, how do we reimagine that medieval liberal arts? What I'm saying, let's just bring Darwin. We've already brought Darwin back. You already have the competitors. Let's just do better what they're doing and, and for the kids who want to do it and uh, so that we don't have this contradiction. But we have two contradictory systems now in the same university. You know, one of the things that interests me is at the same time we're seeing these results about kids not liking school, Harry Potter has succeeded as a bestseller, which is a story about schools. And indeed, in our interviews, when we've talked to kids, when I've talked to fans, whether they would have liked going to Hogwarts better than the schools they went to, overwhelmingly, they would have preferred it. And not just because there was magic involved or they had really cool Yuletide balls. But at a deeper level, I think there's a sense of social identity and belonging, a sense that kids in the world of Hogwarts succeed based on skills that they've acquired 
and they're built in game-like competitions that are part of the learning process in which they're encouraged to pool their knowledge and build on each other's skills in ways that are meaningful and they're given power beyond the school to engage with a larger community of issues. All of those seem to be models of what many students find lacking in the schools as currently structured. See, one of the things that in was just brought up here, one of the things that uh, gamers take as a high level of gaming is a thing called modding. That is using the engine by which the game was made and making a modification of the game, either changing a level or designing a whole new game. That is the idea that if I really like this game and I'm good at it, I should be able to produce a new version of it. Why in college, for heaven's sakes, isn't it a requirement in every learning experience that you don't get out of it until you know how to use the tools we gave you to design something better than I did? Then we'd get a counter-strike. By the way, if the universities then took their cut in it, they'd get rich. Right? <laughs> Just as Will Wright knows, you make them do stuff, don't pay them, and to make profit off of it, everybody wins. <laughs> now cut me in on the deal when you do that. Uh. Yeah. There's somebody way back there. I don't have my glasses, but I do see an arm. Oh, there's someone. Oh, oh there's a bunch of people. See the two mic things. They could go into a race. This could be a game, the mic game. Tracy, you could make a game with mics. Oh, no, you can hold it. Uh, um, I, I was just wondering about the educational background of the, of the, of the uh, gamers. Um, we never really heard too much about that. I, I was just wondering, Good like, what, what are they like in terms of their learning well, experience? Well, so these people are producing high-level stuff. Let's just call it modding, because that is producing novel stuff with the tools you're given. The good, there's good news and bad news. The good news is, you know, in the stuff we've studied, we've got young people, old people, poor people, rich people, minority people, majority people, people from all over the world to do it. So, but there isn't, for example, you know, you know there's supposed to be a gap between poor and rich people in reading in school, but there's no gap in playing Yu-Gi-Oh. No one has found a kid, oh, this kid is from the Philippines, he can't play Yu-Gi-Oh, right? It doesn't happen. That's the good news. The bad news is we are beginning to find out that there's a higher end type of modding, like actually making the game, doing the iterative testing, inventing new add-ons like that doctor damage that require you not only to have a whole statistical model, but to actually then implement it in a digital tool that is being done by more privileged people. Right? We are creating a, an innovation gap and a gap here. And why is that? Because the, we, this is very crucial. The digital gap is not about who has equipment. It's about how, who has mentoring with the equipment. Who gets into rich learning communities that push them further, persists past failure, challenge yourself, know how to get resources in the community, know what is a valuable skill and where it will apply in the world. Uh, it will do you, by the way, there's studies that show this clearly. Handing poor kids powerful machines doesn't help at all if you don't hire, hand them the mentors. Now, of course, we could build these rich affinity spaces for them, right? We could build those if we cared. Now they're, more. Now they're coming. One more. All right, so we're going we're gonna to raffle off this last, no. <laughs> Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentations, and I have an interesting question about um, teacher education. I need to learn from you, I think we all could benefit from learning, how if we understand that students now understand the duping in the game, mm -hmm. and when duping finally levels out, how can I get my teachers, my uh, credentialed teachers, and also my, my candidates, mm -hmm. to kind of get a sense of what it is they would need to do to kind of see that duping and providing their pedagogy a way around, especially during this cusp when things are changing? Right, I mean, that's a $64,000 question um, because the accountability system we have now virtually means you couldn't possibly have success with deep learning, right? Because any accountability system based on a test that's given to everybody, not a sample, will be cheated, right? Because you know what it is, you'll teach to it. That, that. So such accountability systems can't work. Furthermore, they have the other problem. They're like accountability system for a surgeon that says, let's not worry about the, you know, the degree he got, that's fine. Let's just see how many people he kills. If he kills a lot of people, we'll get rid of him, right? It's like, let's let the teachers get certified, and if they, you know, if they hurt, harm, you know, 100 kids, let's get rid of them. Wouldn't it have been better to have done that at the certification thing and then have accountability for curriculum? That is, make good games. So the accountability system is profoundly kind of screwed up. So then the question becomes, 
uh, for teacher education, how can not only understand the way in which curriculum works, so they, see, I want teachers to be seen as designers and resources, resources of people's collaborative learning. I want to see them building passionate affinity space as just the way a game designer builds a game, I want, because I want to reprofessionalize them that way. People always say, well, how are they going to get that? They don't know that. I mean, if, if you're really that good at technology, you go into Microsoft, you know, they, why, they, the one, only way to do this would be to have passionate affinity spaces for teachers that held them to the same standards that kid is holding himself in game design. Why not? Why in the hell are they sitting in a bunch of classes when we could put them into a space where they become passionate experts with advanced teachers, not age graded, no, newbies in there, and some of them actually implement and build stuff not in Sims but in a school. Right? It, it, and then, it, see, it doesn't matter. The people will say, well, the teachers can't teach what they don't know. Guess what? When you first start wanting to build a house for the Sims, you don't know anything. 70 year old woman didn't know a thing. After a couple of years of things, she had 17 million customers. It doesn't matter what you know. It matters what community of learners you're in. Yeah, I would, to pick, to pick up on uh, the teacher training, just a point for a minute. Uh, yeah, we've got the opposite of accountability now. I don't know if you read the LA Times this Sunday, the story about the two teachers, one of whom had ranked among the lowest at a particular school on their success rate, the other the highest. Uh, the, the high, one who got higher and identified by the LA Times a year ago has been teaching other teachers how to teach, and guess which of them got a pink slip recently, <laughs> right? Uh, not the worst teacher in the school, the best teacher in the school is now wondering if he's going to be working next year as we're dealing with budget crunches. But the teacher training part, we're, the work we're doing with RFK, we're working, we're trying to develop a teacher training program where kids are at the center of it. I mean, one of the things that we've discovered is that most of the practices of participatory culture are absolutely banned in school because they use platforms like YouTube, Wikipedia, right. social networking sites that our school by policy block. But every teacher who's any good knows which student in their classroom knows the workaround, and when they need to pull that stuff into their teaching, they work around the system. Well, maybe this question of duping, we draw on our students to provide the workaround and give teachers advice on how to make the system work better for the current generation of students. So that's what we're doing. We're asking the students at RFK to help identify what their teachers need to know to prepare the next generation of students and, helping the, and they're helping us plan the professional development program we're offering to teachers this summer. You know, if, if uh, teachers were in a professional affinity space as good as these, you couldn't fire them, right? Because their production and identity wouldn't be tied to that particular job. So I think Jim said he's only been thanked 14 times. It's the 15th. So if we could massively <laughs> thank Jim and to Henry.